Ladies and gentlemen, this is like my best British accent. How you doing, ladies and gentlemen? I am the American Spy Fox, your host, and today we're kicking off a brand new series, Guns N' Roses. Going to be talking about the formation of Guns N' Roses, how these crazy guys met each other. Be talking about the 80s, specifically the late 80s. Little bit of hair metal, little bit of punk rock, the Sunset Strip, the Troubadour, the Whiskey, the Roxy, the Rainbow. We're going to be talking about how Guns N' Roses affected music culture and what it led to. The grunge years. Mainly, we're going to be concentrating on the original five members, the original Guns N' Roses lineup, and we're going to be talking about Appetite for Destruction. Something a little extra I'm doing for members and patrons, a drum cover of Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction Night Train. Stay tuned to your notifications for that video as well if you're a member or a patron. But before we get started, we're going to go into a new section of my videos that I like to call Random Rock Shit. As most of you already know, most successful YouTube channels have a niche, a gimmick, something that makes them stand out from the crowd. Mine is less a gimmick and more an offering of information. Information that you really don't need, but as a rock fan, you would be interested in hearing. I always try to bring at least, at least one thing to my audience that possibly they've never heard before. This is my attempt. I offer you not one, not two, but three pieces of random rock shit. Are you trying to say something? I never try anything. I just do it. Want to try me? Number one. And please let me know in the comments if you knew these things already or how many of them you knew. Hopefully everybody says one or two. Number one, Duff McKagan, bassist to Guns N' Roses, rock star super hunk, and yes, I call Duff McKagan a super hunk. That dude looks better in his 50s than the majority of us do in our 20s and 30s. Luckily, I don't think any homophobes watch my channel, and if you do, feel free to unsubscribe at any point. I'm a heterosexual dude, but I can admit that Duff McKagan looks pretty goddamn good for being as old as he is, which is why he has such a super hot wife, right? Okay, Duff McKagan, serial boyfriend to supermodels, punk rock extraordinaire, was born and grew up in Seattle, Washington. Now that's easy, everybody knows that. However, did you know that Duff McKagan was in a punk rock band named The Fastbacks and they were signed by Dead Kennedy's lead singer, Jello Biafre? If you're a fan of the Seattle scene in the late 80s, early 90s, you've probably heard of Alternative Tentacles Records. That was Jello's independent record label. Duff McKagan, as a teen, was signed to it. Duff's early punk rock band even once opened up for Black Flag. His entire band, his entire band's girlfriends, even his own girlfriend, started doing heroin behind his back. It all fell apart. That's why he went to LA. Everybody he knew who played music turned into junkies. Now, of course, later Duff would have his own issues with drugs, but at this point in time, all he wants to do is play music. He wasn't into the heroin. He lost his girlfriend, he lost his band, he lost everything, he packed up, he went to LA. Which leads me to number two. Duff has just lost his band. Everybody he knows in Seattle who had any kind of musical talent have turned into heroin addicts. He wants to go somewhere where he can find dedicated musicians. And at this time, the Sunset Strip in LA is packed full of wannabe rock stars. Duff decides to get a job, save his money, pack up his shit, head for LA. He gets a job as a line cook at a local restaurant in Seattle. The line cook that works right next to him, that Duff befriends, well, his name is Bruce. And Bruce has his own ambitions. He's been writing his own fanzine called Sub Pop. Right as Duff is leaving Seattle, Bruce puts out his first seven inch vinyl, teaming up with a guy named Jonathan, putting all their saved money together in the hopes that this new independent record label they call Sub Pop will take off. As you guys know, I'm talking about Jonathan Poneman and Bruce Pavitt, the first to sign Nirvana. Duff worked with Bruce Pavitt at a restaurant as line cooks 
where they became friends. Lastly, random rock fact number three, I'll make this one nice and short so we can get on with the Guns N' Roses video. Again, Duff McKagan. Ever since Guns N' Roses broke up, Duff McKagan's done a lot of different musical ventures. He started another super group, Velvet Revolver, which was very successful. He does a lot of stuff locally in LA too. He plays at the Whiskey a lot. He's good friends with Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols. They play together. Duff plays with Chad Smith of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam, Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters. He really likes to collaborate with people. There's one person that you know, a household name in the 90s, that Duff has collaborated with on several occasions that you would never guess in a million years. Do you guys remember a singer in the 90s who went by the name Seal? I believe his hit was called Kiss from a Rose or Kissed by a Rose, something like that. Seal is a closet punk rocker. Not only does he love to listen to punk rock, he loves to play punk rock. He's actually collaborated with Duff and they've played together at the Whiskey. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Three random rock facts. Random rock shit that you didn't need to know, but as a rock fan, you probably thought it was pretty cool. Especially if you've never heard any of those things before. Let me know in the comments what you'd heard, what you already knew, and possibly if you learned anything new, let me know that too. Let's get on with Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction. <laughs> This is the Guns N' Roses that we all think of. This huge corporate, super rich rock stars playing these huge stadiums. Girls on tap, drugs on tap, bodyguards, chauffeurs, spiritual advisors, masseuse, whatever they want just a snap of the fingers away. And it's easy to believe that it was just so easy for Guns N' Roses, that it was just always like that. Hell, even Kurt Cobain thought of them as bigger than him, richer than him. He was signed to the same label. He made just as much money as they did. Kurt Cobain was a household name, just like Axl Rose. He filled stadiums even larger than Guns N' Roses had at that time. But he always thought of them as somehow bigger. When the truth of the matter is, the guys from Guns N' Roses started out the same way as Nirvana. Homeless, dirt poor punk rockers. I've come to learn a lot about these two bands and what I believe is for the guys in Nirvana and their feud with Guns N' Roses, it had nothing to do with any of their roots or where they came from. It had nothing to do with the musical genre which each band chose or how they chose to express themselves or how they dressed. It had nothing to do with any of that. It had to do with how individuals react act to fame. Is it going to give you a big head and turn you into a monster? I think Axel's legitimately crazy. I mean, I don't think it's an act, but you can't deny his appeal. Or are you going to remain humble? Hey Kurt, say hi. <laughs> it had to do with how each band accepted fame and how they reacted to fame. Now this isn't a video to bash anybody, I'm not putting anybody down or holding anybody up high. I just want to talk about Guns N' Roses origins, their rise to fame, and then how they treated people and how they reacted to that fame, sort of in comparison to how the guys from Nirvana reacted to fame. 
that bothered people like Kurt Cobain and the musical scene that he came up in. I guess you could say an 80s versus 90s mentality. You gotta take sides. Yeah. No on nine. But I'm talking about Axel here. Just hang on a second. You're talking about an asshole? <laughs> Man, I just guys, I think you guys should let music be music, man. Let everybody express what they want, man. Yeah. Be it a hard rock, be it Nirvana, right be on, it man. anyone, man. Just yeah. let them rock the way they want to rock, yeah, okay? Right, right on, man, but All right? that's a corporate establishment. Which but you can't really let a rock star who obviously likes to beat women and likes to control women and who likes to tell women to shut up. And who is niggers and faggots? is a racist and a homophobe. So for those who don't know, why is Kurt Cobain calling Axl Rose a homophobe and a racist? I think that my regular viewers, my subscribers, my Nirvana fans out there would be pretty ticked off at me if I didn't touch on this subject. Guns N' Roses' second album, Lies, had a song called One in a Million, and within the lyrics of that song, you will find the word niggers and you will find the word faggots. Perhaps you've seen videos on YouTube about the feud between Nirvana and Guns N' Roses. I myself have a video about it. I think it's the most highly viewed video I have, and the very first video I even made about music. Had I known it was going to be viewed by so many people, I would have taken my time and went into much more detail. But that's okay, we can do it right now. 1992 MTV Music Awards, Courtney Love is antagonizing Axl Rose. Axl yells at Kurt, says, shut your bitch up. Again, two different worlds, two different decades. That is the wrong thing to say to a feminist couple like Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love who believe that the male and female are equal and a man does not control the woman that he's dating. She chooses her own way of thinking, speaking, behaving. I myself conduct my own relationship in the same manner. However, from what I know of Courtney Love, I personally believe that she was trying to elicit a response from Axl Rose. She was the antagonist. She knew she was taking things too far. She wanted to see a fight break out and she got what she asked for. Guns N' Roses had always been a band that were known to take shit from no one. Duff McKagan is a kickboxer who was trained by a world champion kickboxer. If you're looking for a fight, Guns N' Roses is the band to fuck with. Courtney Love knew this. I do not believe that any of this would have ever happened if it weren't for Courtney Love who, if you study enough like I have, you come to find that she was quite obsessed with Axl Rose. She has mentioned him numerous times over numerous years. It's obvious that she had a thing for Axl Rose and could not obtain Axl Rose. I've even pondered, and I'm just throwing this out there, but I've even pondered, what if Courtney Love made Kurt Cobain jealous purposefully by talking a lot about Axl Rose, by saying, oh, I wanted to mate with someone, and well, you know, I met you and not Axl. So the two guys in rock with the best noses were Axl Rose and Kurt Cobain, and I certainly wasn't gonna mate with Axl Rose. Her statement and Courtney Love behind the music has always bothered me, coupled with the numerous times I've seen her mention Axl Rose in interviews and transcripts. She tries to play it off like she could have had Axl Rose, Axl Rose was known to date supermodels. Courtney Love could not obtain Axl Rose. She never had a chance to begin with. So why are you even trying to make us believe that somehow you could have mated with Axl? We all know that's false. It's the same as her obsession with Madonna. Back in the 90s, she used to try to fuck with Madonna any chance she got. She'd put Madonna down. Guess what? Her and Madonna are now friends. She idolizes Madonna. She's admitted to it. I think she idolized Axl Rose, but he's not looking back on it laughing, saying, haha, remember that time you fucked with me? Like Madonna has. Second thing I want to say about Courtney Love behind the music, have you ever noticed Nirvana music plays through the whole thing? It's because she owned the rights to it. That's what makes the documentary so good. 
is all the Nirvana information. Young women have a tendency to try and make their partner jealous, you know what I'm saying? Or if they secretly like somebody, talk about them a lot. That woman is criminally manipulative. I really wouldn't put it past her if she did, if behind the scenes there was more going on to that feud than we ever knew about. She could have seriously got Kurt, Chris, or Dave hurt that day. Seriously. They had bodyguards with them. Duff is there, Slash is there, Axel's bodyguards are there. Chris Novoselic almost gets into a fist fight with Duff McKagan. A six foot seven Chris Novoselic versus a six foot four Duff McKagan. It was pretty serious. So in Kurt Cobain's mind, let's try to put ourselves in his shoes. He has this horrible encounter with Axel. Possibly he's already a, maybe a little jealous of Axel. Not as a musician, but because his woman is always talking about Axel Rose. Let me ask you guys out there. Don't you think it's a bit annoying when your woman starts talking about another man all the time? Probably wouldn't like that very much. Couple this with the fact that Axel had been in the papers all over the press for domestic violence issues. But here's the thing that I have to point out, and I know that my Nirvana fans are going to get mad at me possibly for pointing this out. I hope not, but Kurt Cobain had been to jail for domestic violence issues. We put Kurt up on this pedestal, and, and I myself am guilty of it too. We put him up on this pedestal like he's not human or something, like he can do no wrong. But especially now, since he's gone we don't allow him to be human but he was a human being and human beings are imperfect creatures Kurt was a human being and human beings are imperfect and him and Courtney had gotten into their own fights that resulted in Kurt going to jail. I'm not saying that he ever hit her or anything like that, but he was charged with domestic violence. He was put in jail just like Axl Rose. Kurt and Courtney later would explain, oh, you know, we were wrestling or we, we were just yelling loud and the neighbors called the cops on us. Well, who's to say that that wasn't going on with Axl Rose? Matter of fact, I read an interview with Axl Axel, because once you're a rich rock star, you get to live in rich neighborhoods. And those neighbors are used to peace and quiet, not a rock star living in the neighborhood. I read an interview with Axel Rose where he's talking about how it wasn't anybody in his home calling the police. It was his neighbors calling the police for them being too loud, yelling at each other, playing loud music. Matter of fact, in my state, in Ohio, we have something called verbal domestic violence. Let me know if this is in your state as well. That means if you and your wife, you and your boyfriend, you and your husband, whatever, if you're arguing and your neighbors can hear it and they call the police, one of you is going to jail for verbal domestic violence. Not disturbing the peace, not disorderly conduct, anything like that. Verbal domestic violence. It sounds worse than it is. Now the problem with this is, it doesn't matter how perfect of a human being you are, you're going to get into a screaming match with your boyfriend or girlfriend, your husband or wife. At some point in your relationship, you're going to scream at each other. So possibly, it was similar situations. Let me add one little more tidbit. One of the domestic violence situations that took place at the Seattle home of Kurt and Courtney, she did have marks around her neck. And at first, she told the cops that Kurt had threw her down and was restraining her by choking her. Later, she redacted that statement. I'm not condoning domestic violence, but if ever a bitch needed an ass whooping, it's Courtney Love. Was Axel antagonizing them? Or was it more likely that Courtney Love was antagonizing Axel Rose? to elicit a response. According to Courtney Love's story, which you have to understand that Kurt loved Courtney so much that he would go along with her stories, okay? And according to her story, she just jokingly said, hey Axel, will you be the godfather to our baby? It was just an innocent little joke and he flipped out about it. Do you really think that's all there was to it, knowing Courtney Love's behavior and how she treats people? Courtney Love has literally punched her own male fans in the face and got away with it. And that's gonna come up in whole series number three, yet another scandal with Courtney where she pays a judge off to avoid assault charges. So looking at this from Kurt's point of view, he's had these horrible encounters with Axel Rose. He knows that Axel is known for going to jail for domestic violences and now Axel uses two very 
powerful, uh, derogatory words in one of his songs. Kurt has summed up Axel and decided that he's a racist and a homophobe. The truth is, none of us will ever know unless you get to know Axel Rose personally. Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction was one of the biggest selling records of all time. It was their debut album, their very first go at it. I'm going to explain to you Axl Rose's side and why he says he chose to use the word nigger. He chose to use the word faggots in one of his songs, One in a Million, on their follow-up album, Guns N' Roses Lies. Personally, I think that he was afraid. He was afraid of failure. When your debut album puts you on the map worldwide, makes you a household name, and it's the best thing anyone's heard since Zeppelin in the 70s, well, how do you top that? Unfortunately for Axel, he chose to be controversial. He wanted to elicit a reaction. He used his fame, his stature, his rock god celebrity, threw those words in a song, knowing that it would elicit a huge reaction. He also knew that part of that reaction was going to be negative. There was going to be some backlash. For some strange reason, and I can't believe nobody stopped him, especially Slash, seeing how Slash's mother is African American, for some strange reason, Axel saw it as no different than, Axel saw it as no different when Eminem eventually rapped about how much he hated his mother, or Two Live Crew said, me so horny, or when Eazy-E rapped about robbing a bank. It was shock value. You just have to be really careful, because like these, a, a lot of people take all kinds of meanings out of your songs, which has nothing to do with the fact that basically it's about something that happened in your life two years ago. Axel turned another life experience into a song on the band's follow-up EP, GNR Lies. One in a Million is an odyssey through downtown LA's jungle of urban decay. The lyrics contain a racial epithet and derogatory references to immigrants and homosexuals. A lot of people just take the time to assume that when a white person uses the word nigger, it's meant that's a whole black race and you're derogatory and you're a racist. I don't think people take the time to listen to the third verse and figure that one out because it says radicals and racists don't point your finger at me. I'll be asked about that word for the rest of my life. He's in an interview telling us, oh, I knew for the rest of my life that I'd be answering to that one word. And by the way, it's not just one word. He, do he doesn't just use the N word. He also uses the F word and not F U. He uses faggots. From Axel's point of view, he's saying, I wasn't using that word to generalize an entire group of people, which wouldn't that suck? Like as white people, we, we really don't understand how powerful that word is. We really don't. Imagine having your entire being, everything you are, everything you've ever done, summed up in one derogatory word. That would be shitty, wouldn't it? Like, you don't know me. You don't know what I've done with my life. You, do, you don't know my family. You don't know anything about me. And you're going to sum me up in one fucking word? That's why the word's so powerful. Axel's saying, I used it for its literal definition. And I believe that the definition of the N-word is those of a, a lower social class or something along those lines. I don't even care to look it up in a dictionary. But I believe it means people of a low stature, a lower social class. And he's saying, I wasn't talking about black people. I was talking about street bums and people who steal and rob and the guy on the street selling fake gold chains that he stole from this guy. But here's the thing, guys. He, he could be serious. Maybe he really did just mean it for its literal definition, but he also knew what kind of response it would elicit. And that's why, that's why I personally think that he was scared. And he was like, how do I top Appetite for Destruction? It took Appetite a while to start selling, but once it did, it took off, it sold millions, I think like 12 million copies in the first two years. What if I put out my next album and no one talks about it? No one cares. I have to make sure that they're talking about my next album, which is the EP Lies that has the song 
one in a million with these offensive words in it? How do I bring as much attention to my second album as I did my first album? Well, there's this really powerful word that I could throw in some lyrics and that would sure get the attention of journalists. By the way, to this day, Axl Rose, I don't really think Axl Rose is a racist, honestly. Number one, Slash is black. Duff McKagan once went into the rainbow, leading the charge with Axel close behind him and attacked Chris Holmes of Wasp, broke three of his ribs for calling Slash a nigger. So I don't think that those guys are racist. Um, although, you know, it's like, why, why did you feel the need to use that word if you're not racist you know what i mean it's it grunge fans nirvana fans we have a really tough time with this because guns and roses music kicks ass but it's almost like it was ruined by one word that the lead singer used that could have easily been replaced by so many other words that describe undesirable people i believe the new word for crazy ass people you want to avoid on the street is a karen correct me if i'm wrong that's what my kids say anyway. It's it's also worth mentioning that Axl Rose has always used black bodyguards. Apparently he feels safer around black men, which is kind of odd if you think about his song. Again, I think he just used it to elicit a huge response. Didn't matter whether it was negative or positive, he just wanted to ensure that his second follow-up to the biggest record since Zeppelin got some attention. I personally subscribe to the notion that Axel was just trying to top his first album. We we're more prepared to fight to the death and go down in flames than to make it. We we're gonna do anything to make it. It's been proven time and time again that a millionaire who goes bankrupt will four times out of five will at some point in their life once again be a millionaire. It's also been proven that when dirt poor people win the lottery, within just a few short months or a couple years, they'll be broke and it'll pretty much be that way for the rest of their lives. Us poor people are not used to money. So when we come into money, we spend it like there's no tomorrow. And the guys in Guns N' Roses were no exception. Hey, the Los Angeles band Guns N' Roses are an 80s version of the Sex Pistols. Well, one of the reasons they are that kind of version is because rumor has it that they walked into David Geffen's record office, got an $80,000 advance, and then proceeded to have some of the biggest parties that Los Angeles has ever seen. What is actually the truth? We're just about to find out. We did get a good amount of cash. More than we've ever seen. <laughs> More than we've ever seen. Oh, wow, so and, uh, but, you know, the first thing we did, really, is go out and get equipment. The first second day we had the money we went to the music store and we got all new equipment i mean we were all playing on trash equipment all right trash so we went first thing and got equipment of course you get a great amount of money you're playing in a band you never get any money when you're in a band you're gonna go out and get stuff that you've never had before you're gonna take a taxi to the liquor store okay that's only two blocks away and steak lobster you know you're gonna do a little crazy Long stuff island iced teas don't know tomorrow <laughs> You know, so you're gonna you're gonna get into that because you never had money before. You're 19, 20 years old. Manage money that doesn't even come into your brain. If you've lived your whole life without money and you come into a lot of it, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna give some to your friends. You're gonna give some to your family. You're gonna go buy a car. You're gonna get better musical equipment. You're gonna take some girls out on dates. You start spending. And I want to clarify because I don't want to offend anybody. I'm saying if you grew up in a family that's maybe not super rich but always done well for themselves themselves, educated, knows how to manage finances. As Duff said, we don't know how to manage finances. We've never had money before. Maybe you grew up with a mom who's a financial analyst and she prepares reports for bigwigs at JP Morgan Chase Bank. You're going to be a lot more likely to manage your money if you happen to come into a bunch of it all at once. That kid's going to have a better chance than, say, a kid who took off from Seattle in an old beat-up car looking for musicians 
musicians to start a punk rock band with. And if you're lucky enough, like the guys in Guns N' Roses who had such great albums that they continue to make money from those same songs to this very day. By the way, that huge concert with all those people singing along, that was from like four years ago. So they're still filling stadiums. Nearly three decades later, these guys from Guns N' Roses are, are still filling stadiums. If you're lucky like them, you can keep replenishing your money. But for people who say win a few million dollars on the lottery and they've never had money, well, a couple Harleys, a Corvette, and a double wide trailer later, and then they realize they gotta pay taxes, um, they're broke. And the guys in Guns N' Roses are lucky. Just like Nirvana's music, their music was so good that it continues to transcend generations, continues to generate revenue. However, even Duff himself has said that they've probably lost more money to people skimming off the top and taking from them than they have actually earned. My tw 20s were tumultuous uh, at best, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thought came to my head, like I've made money in my 20s. Now I made a good amount of money. I don't know how much. I don't know who has taken from me, how much they have, if they have, which they did. When you don't even know how to read a financial statement, well, your accountant and your manager might take advantage of you. What I'm trying to say is the guys in Nirvana treated money and fame a lot different than the guys in Guns N' Roses. Duff Slash, Steven, Axel, Jeff, they went nuts. At one point, Guns N' Roses had bodyguards, professional masseuse. Axel had a spiritual advisor who traveled with him. You know what Kurt had? He had Courtney Love. But then again, she may have siphoned more money than any bodyguards or spiritual advisor ever did from Axel, so... Axel's ego exploded, and, and so did the other guys in Guns N' Roses as well. Their egos exploded, and they expected people to treat them like royalty. Whereas people in the grunge years were more humble, modest, down to earth. Hey, we're one of you. We're in this together. Years and years later, once we get to know Duff McKagan better, we understand that he wasn't really like that. And guess what? He was from Seattle. I saw The Clash in 79, a band that was so, so exotic to me. They were from, I saw Zeppelin in 77 play The Kingdom. It was enormous. And you, the band was so small and so far away. And I saw some other big bands. I saw Kiss and whatnot. And the punk rock thing, hit and, and the Clash were playing right in front of me and after the show like they came out into the crowd and, and Strummer said something on the stage that always made it, left an indentation on me which was there's no difference between us and you we're all the same we're in it, we're in it together and uh, thus was born like a DIY punk rock scene in Seattle and we did everything ourselves making flyers booking shows carting gear uh, booking VFW halls, like union halls, lying to the police that it was like a whatever it was, a dance, a teen dance, but we were having punk rock shows. Duff even went to community college and eventually on to university to get a degree so he understood how to manage his own finances. He was so ignorant to the whole bureaucracy process of any government or state institution that he thought he could just write a check and get into university. I wanted to go to Seattle U, to Albert School of Business. I, I thought I could go in and write a check and mm -hmm. just go to school and they, I got a GED and I couldn't just go in and write a check. They let me know. Um, so I had to go through community college uh, at Seattle Central and, and get A's in these classes and write an uh, admittance essay. But he did the right thing. He worked his way up. He started at the ground roots at the community college. He proved himself. He went on to university. And now he can manage his own finances, book his own tours, all that good shit. At the same time, Kurt Cobain, Chris Novoselic, Dave Grohl are the biggest band on earth. Right next to Guns N' Roses, they have no bodyguards no handlers, no spiritual advisors. He hung out with the same people that he came up in the scene with. It took Guns N' Roses a while for their first album to really hit, but when it hit, it hit big, and we're gonna talk about that. Now for Nirvana, it happened really fast after their first big album dropped. What did they do? They hid. They, they literally stopped touring, went home. Dave went home to his mom. Chris went home to his wife. Courtney hid Kurt away in an apartment in Hollywood and got him busy making a baby so she could get him to marry her. 
and they didn't do much. When Guns N' Roses hit, they were out on the Sunset Strip, out in the open, acting crazy, driving, driving sports cars, going to strip clubs, just handing out $100 bills, buying big bags of Coke. They went absolutely crazy. In Guns N' Roses' defense, they were a little younger than Nirvana when they got famous, but still, it shows you that these are two different groups of two totally different people. Some people can handle fame really well and they remain humble. Others start to have a god complex, like Axl Rose. Don't take me the wrong way. I loved Guns N' Roses as a kid, man. I had an 80s aunt with the big bleached blonde teased hair and, and the jean jacket. She had Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue patches. She turned me on to that whole scene when I was just a little kid. Guns N' Roses was the first band that I ever even knew existed. This is no lie, no BS. Some of my earliest memories are of my aunt screaming, it's Axel, it's Axel, he's come to get me. My aunt hung out at our house a lot. She was very attached to my mother, her older sister. And whenever a plane would fly overhead, she would point at it and jokingly scream, Axel's finally come to get me. Th these are my earliest memories. And in defense of Guns N' Roses, the 80s was a decade of death. Decadence. Now, obviously, I was too young. I wasn't a teenager. I wasn't college age, but I bet some of my viewers were, and I bet that you could tell us in the comments what the 80s was like. From what I've read, from the interviews I see, it was a time of material possession and cocaine, thanks to Pablo Escobar and the American that Johnny Depp plays in the movie Blow, getting that cocaine from Colombia into America. It was just a decade of decadence, and that is the decade that these guys came up in. The 90s was a time of repression and were paying for the sins of the 80s. The 80s was all about bank loans and getting things that you couldn't afford and were paying for them in the 90s and people culturally become more frugal. Profit. Wall Street. Where we screwed up in the 80s is that we were all trying to get rich and famous. Pounds. Dollar. Millionaire. Pounds. Dollar. Pounds. Pounds. Dollar. Pounds. Dollar. Pounds. Dollar. Pounds. Dollar. Pounds. I believe that the supply side theory is workable. You're going to get a better economy, you're going to get more jobs, you're going to get a higher standard of living. By God, in America, one of the great things about this nation is that we can seek profit. And I'm proud of that. If you can gain profit, that's even better. This is where all that dark, sarcastic humor comes from. Being a kid in the 90s was like your parents partied on credit and then left you with the debt. But you left me in debt, and now I can't get a bank loan. Now, I, now, now you've ruined the market. Now I can't even get a decent paying job. People become more frugal with their money. In Soundgarden, in Alice in Chains, in Nirvana, in Pearl Jam. It's almost like they're singing through the hangover of the 80s. The early 90s bands were singing Hail Marys for the 80s band's sins. 